Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Killraven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man-Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week, appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keene. For our first episode, of course, on the aptly named Brian Keene Radio Network. <laughs> I know. It's, it's literally, at least George Washington didn't name the city after himself. You know, it's it's a thing. But yes, on the on the Brian Keene on the Brian Keen and Dungeon Master seventy seven point one radio network. That's right. That's right. Dungeon Master seventy seven point one, my twelve year old, uh, of course, home like every other kid in America, sitting here in the background. Right now he's coding a video game, but he may chime in at some point. But yeah. Well, you know, I, I I have to interrupt you and say that um I'm glad that he's there and I, I, I wanna get his opinion um, on this one subject before we get into it, hopefully he can pull himself away from it because in reading giant size, uh, supervillain team up one and two, um, I couldn't help but think, you know, you often joke that, uh, that you and I are the Batman and Superman respectively of the horror genre. And I want to say that I don't, uh, uh, think that much of myself but brian does let's be clear about no, that 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 is incorrect <laughs> i'm gonna stop you right there i i make that joke only because others make that joke about us oh, okay All right, um good. and well, personality but, type yeah we probably do match in that regard. <laughs> i want to say though that it, it's interesting to me um to read this i thought well i wonder which marvel universe villains brian and i would be Oh, that's a great analogy, yes. And I wonder if Dungeon Master has an opinion on that. What Marvel Universe villain would your father be? Come over here so so everyone can hear you. Well, I think you'd honestly be the Joker. I'd be the Joker, but that's DC. Oh, Marvel. It's got to be Marvel, according to Mr. Chris. Marvel. Um, I have to say, you'd probably be Thanos. Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that when the snap comes, Dungeon Master and I both survive. That's all I. <laughs> well, who who would Mister Chris be if I'm Thanos? So it's kind of like it would have to be a duo because a duo. Yeah. Well, Th- who is Thanos teamed up with, Chris? Uh, well, with Death, Brian. But you yeah, know. Death. <laughs> yeah. So Chris would be Death. Yeah. Yeah. Not nearly as attractive as Marvel's death. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, well, it, you know, I think that's that's probably pretty accurate. Although reading this, I did think that, uh, you know, <laughs> you did. I might. I don't know if I'm Doctor Doom, but uh, but you do remind me sometimes of Namor, Brian. Oh, I. You know, and I, the reason well, all- the reason I say that is because. You know, when Namor is trying to, uh, is trying to do good, he often lays waste to those before him. And when he's trying to do things that are bad, he often ends up defeating the other bad guys. Yeah. I've always, always <laughs> loved Prince Namor the Submariner. Uh, you know, he's one of the first superheroes I encountered back in the pages of the Defenders. Uh, you know, I, I knew him from the Defenders long before I knew any of the rest of his history. Um, yeah, I, I love Namor. Well, and I, think, know, I, I think I think then, too, it would be accurate to suggest that I would be in this instance, I would be Dr. Doom because Doom always thinks he knows what's best for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the time he's right. I mean, it's just, let's let's face it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right. All right. For those of you who know us who are listening to that, you may find that more amusing. And the rest of you, thanks for indulging us. We're going to cover yeah. giant size supervillain team up at least issue one uh, in this uh, episode. At least. And and Chris, I just want to give a shout out uh, to uh, Chet Williamson for that brand new introduction folks just heard at the start of the show. And uh, uh, electronica artist Xander Harris, uh, very popular 
electronica artist, if, if you're into that sort of music, you, you probably recognized, uh, you know, his, his style there at the beginning, but he composed our brand new theme and, and gave us permission to use it and told his label, this is theirs, you know, don't copyright strike them on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks to well, them both. Yeah. Uh, thank you to both of those gentlemen. And, uh, and I will say that Chet Williamson has the sexiest voice alive. He really does. He really does. <laughs> so, okay. Giant size super villain team up number one. I am so happy. I'll tell you, other than those defenders titles, I don't know that anything, any, any, any other bronze age book brings me as much joy as this series does. Um, I just, I love it. I, it, it gets just as crazy as the defenders and the champions at yep. some points, but I love it. Uh, creative team for this issue, Roy Thomas, uh, in both the writing and editorial role, uh, John B. Schema and Joe Sennett are the artists. Uh, Janice Cohen is the colorist and Artie Simek is the letterer. Yeah. And I want to just say from the outset, from the cover, Brian, 68 big pages for 50 cents. That's right. 68 pages, 50 cents. I believe 68 pages in, in modern terms would cost something like $27, but something like that. I could yep. be wrong. And I remember when these, when these giant size, uh, Marvels would come out, it was a conundrum for me because I could get four comic books for a dollar every week. Right. You know, that was, that was my, that was my allowance. And, uh, when the giant sizes would come out, they're 50 cents. And it's like, Ooh, you know, do I want to gamble on one of those or do I want to stick to my four comics? So, but I, I remember buying this one. Um, and again, you know, you know, 50 cents, actually not a bad bargain for, for this at the time. Not um, at all. And, and I, we should say, by the way, that this is, uh, Dr. Doom and the Savage Submariner, but it also includes, Within those 68 pages, a number of reprints, uh, as laying the groundwork for the team ups of the future between these two characters. So we see, we get to see the whole history of their efforts to try to get along, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and they're actually, they're doomed, no pun intended, efforts to try to team up. Um, but it's sort of like that, uh, the, you know, the parable of the, uh, what, what is it? The fox and the scorpion or the, the yeah. 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 Or the, the, what is it? It's not a fox turtle. I don't know. Whatever. I, well, it, it depends on which culture. I mean, that, that folklore is that, that there's a version of that story in almost, almost every continent. Yeah. So that, that's yeah, so. the thing. It's like, you know, you've got two characters, both of whom, uh, only team up in, in, in anytime they team up, it's against their nature. That's, that's right. right. So there we that's go. That's right. So, yeah, we open with uh, outer space, and there's something shooting through outer space coming into Earth's atmosphere. But it's not a meteorite, Chris. What is it? It is Dr. Doom uh, not just falling through the atmosphere, but somehow uh, traveling through space like a meteorite until he basically burns through Earth's atmosphere. And apparently, even though his body is armored, uh, his... Uh, his clothing is somehow also protected from reentry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and we, we get a little flashback here. We find out that this issue takes place after the events of fantastic Four 155, uh, when silver surfer and Dr. Doom got into it. And, uh, I, I don't know that we need to recap all that, but basically it ends with Dr. Doom falling through space. Yeah. Yeah. And, there, and there's a recap. Uh, I like, I will say that rather than recap, I just want to point out as someone who is a stickler for continuity, I mean, I don't call other people on it, but if I'm writing a story in another, uh, in another licensed world, I want to make sure I know where the story falls and and you can never fault Roy Thomas because you know he's always going to make sure that he knows exactly how his story works into the rest of the Marvel continuity. Not only that, he takes six panels to let the reader know, yep. hey, basically this takes place between Fantastic Four issues 144 and 155. Yep. And, and then and tells you exactly what happened to Doctor Doom 
uh, in between those issues. Uh, and, and in this and, case, we have a fantastic uh, two-page spread beneath that of Doctor Doom uh, floating in the water uh, in his armor. Uh, and, and he might sink Brian in that armor, but then he has a, a uh, an amazingly uh, coincidental arrival. That's right. Uh, we see a very familiar submersible craft surface, uh, and out pops Namor, the first Prince Regent of Sunken Atlantis, obviously no stranger to listeners of this show. He's one of the primary members of the Defenders, and Namor is excited because at last his long weeks of constant vigil are rewarded. It turns out he's been looking for Dr. Doom, um, who is now floating near death, uh, kept afloat only by an automatically activated force field whose energy is nearly spent. Namor can tell all this just by looking at Yeah, him. and that's one of the things I love about Roy's writing. It's like, character who can't possibly know thing tells audience <laughs> thing audience needs to know. Um, and, and Namor also knows that another minute, and he would have been too late to save the life of Dr. Doom, uh, Victor Von Doom, uh, also, he tells us where it falls in Submariner series continuity, which we appreciate. Um, so he has only seconds to save Dr. Doom's life, uh, and he puts Dr. Doom on his Stimulatron. And I thought the Stimulatron was something only cheap motels offered if you stuck a quarter in the machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway... He's that I like there's a there's a nice touch that Roy Thomas does here, particularly for for Bronze Age Marvel. There's as after he puts Doctor Doom on the on the machine, he says, and then if I still remember how, I must pray. Yeah, it's just I like those little touches. Yeah, you know, if you of course if you did that nowadays, Twitter would explode and and half the people would be angry that Namor is praying and the other half would be angry that he's not and. <laughs> I don't know, but I just I like those touches. But guess what? Namer's prayers are answered. It works. Doctor Doom lives. Yeah, and and you want to shout out to Roy Thomas, and I want to shout out to John Buscema because the top, uh, the first panel on that page with Zoom getting zapped by the Stimulatron and his like arms flying up. It's such a great panel, you know. It's just like. You know, I, I think back on this era and in my mind, a lot of the artwork is really sort of hokey. You know, I'm, a lot of it I love, but in my mind, a lot of it is sort of hokey. And then you see stuff like this and you're like, wow, damn, that is just so great. Uh, you know, it's oh, so it's cool. gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Um, anyway, Doom, Doom wakes up, Brian, and he is just as, uh, as grateful as you might imagine Dr. Doom to be. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, he, he says his, his, you know, his senses have returned to him. He recognizes Namor. And more than that, he remembers that they are sworn and deadly foes. Yeah, it's... <laughs> and Namor says, only if you wish it to be. So basically, Doom is like, what are you talking about? You know, we hate each other. And Namor begins to insist that they are natural allies. And that's what Doom said the last time their paths crossed in Submariner number 20. Right. Um, and I love the days when we'd have the editor's notes telling us exactly when those things were. But they yep. worked together against the Fantastic Four. That's right. And, uh, you know, Namor says, uh, you know, when that happened, we were a team, invincible. Together, we could rule the world which has rejected us both, the surface men who have all but destroyed my people and who are the inferiors of us both. So basically, Folks, what you need to understand here, because some of you may only know Namor from our, our Defenders coverage, um, and you forget Namor is the, the monarch of Atlantis. He's the ruler. Yeah. And at the time, in the 70s, uh, it's much like it is now with the environment, and that is laying waste to Atlantis. So, you know, Namor's going to declare war on the surface world to stop that, to protect his people. And he's willing to it's use like, Dr. Doom. It's sort of like if Al Gore had had an army. Yeah. It, it, Al Gore's going to team up with Dr. Doom to start global war. You know what's weird, too, is in this era, Al Gore looked a lot like Namor. Hmm. Same, <laughs> same Widow's Peak, you know? Um, 
Well, so then, then we cut into, uh, the, our first flashback of this issue, um, which covers, I believe, the first time, uh, these two met and, or the last time they met. And Doom says, uh, the last time they met, the first time they met was actually yes. Fantastic Four number six, but Namor had amnesia at the time. Right. And that's and actually remember. what we're covering here. Yep. Right. Um, yeah, we're covering Submariner 20. Right. Okay. Which is the last time they've met. Right. So this is written by Roy Thomas again and art by John Buscema again. Uh, and we begin with Namor uh, having lost his memory in this period. Right. Yep. No. Let me look. Hold well, on. no, he, he, he yeah, it, this is. He, he he doesn't have his memory in Fantastic Four Six. Oh right, okay, okay. Because um, I, I read this a few, you know, uh, a few days ago, um, and and this gives me an opportunity. You know, he you know he knows he's the he's the sovereign of fabled Atlantis beneath the lapping waves, uh, and he's angry about how the humans treat him. But he's trapped at this point on land, Brian, because and he doesn't know who did it. Right. He's saying, why do I rail thus against the surface dwellers? Was it they who closed my gills so that I may no longer breathe underwater? And then, Brian, he, he unfortunately, Roy Thomas unfortunately has Namor draw attention to the thing that's going to make Namor a difficult character for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The little wings on his ankle. <laughs> Was it they who <laughs> sapped my wings of their strength? So I may no longer fly. So f- to refresh the memory of those who, uh, who listened to this series from the beginning when we talked about Namor and the Defenders, Namor has little wings on his ankles and these tiny little wings. And supposedly he is able to fly at great speed and great height and great maneuverability using nothing but these tiny little wings on his ankles. Um, this is, really really fucking stupid and <laughs> and i think that uh this is why it's going to be a problem in the mar- now now namor is later in marvel continuity to be revealed to be a mutant um and my hope is that that's what they'll end up doing in the marvel cinematic universe and that his flight is explained in some other fashion because there's just no way in my opinion to pull this off without it being dumb right, right. And right. I forget I about it in the comics about. until Namor draws attention to it. I don't even think about it. Yeah, yeah I was never crazy about the, the retcon where they made him a mutant, but I agree. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it would work. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, Chris, I want to stop you right there because uh, the troops, the, you know, the U.S. Army shows up to confront Namor and a fight breaks out. But I'm reading these in the original published version and when you turn the page you get the bullpen's bulletin page okay and you know what they were talking about that month what were they talking about marvel value stamps do you remember the marvel value stamps of course i do the when in the days when marvel encouraged you to destroy your own comic books yep um you you they would every letters page would have a, a little stamp that you would cut out and you could send to marvel you could get this free stamp album and the stamps were like a, a puzzle. You had to collect them all and put them all together, and then you'd get an image, and you could turn the image in for prizes and swag from Marvel. Um, and you know, if you buy any Bronze Age comic these days, you get a fifty-fifty chance of there being a hole in the letters page as a result. Now, how do our listeners, our four listeners, now that we're on the Brian Keene Radio Network? No, 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 no. Now, now, now we can tell our our. Our true list, our true listening numbers, which uh, as of today is zero because I don't have the data. Because uh, <laughs> there you go. So network. for our It'll zero listeners, how do our zero <laughs> listeners get their hands on the Brian Keene value stamp? That's what I want to know. The Brian Keene value stamp. Yeah. That is that is something I should do. I think. I think so. I think for so. today it's a no prize, uh, but. Uh, anyway, all right. So, so someone who notices a young boy who notices Namor out the window, and I love this bit, falls out the window because he was paying too much attention and lost his balance. Um, and Namor rushes over to catch him. Uh, and then, as you said, the military shows up in search of him and they're, they're rushing to look for him. And Namor just saved the kid's life. And the kid is grateful and says, I'll never tell Namor. And I won't, 
I won't say which way he went. And in the very next panel, Brian, the kid throws him under the bus. <laughs> the very next, he doesn't even wait a panel. It's the next panel. Yep. <laughs> the army shows up. Because, He's like, he went because that he away. His picture in the paper. <laughs> exactly. That's right. He wants to get his pitch, his picture in the paper. Right. So the army gives chase, and uh, Namer comes upon uh, a building. And uh, despite his super strength, the the iron gate that guards this building will not budge. Um, We see a shadowed figure inside opening the gate. Namer disappears inside. The army stops because they realize the building that Namer has disappeared inside of is what, Chris? It is the Latvarian Embassy. And for those unfamiliar, Latveria is the ancestral home of Dr. Doom. He is the ruler of that tiny Eastern European country that is, in fact, he mentions, so small, it's not even on most maps. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I mean, that's pretty small. Luxembourg is on most maps, and it's pretty small. Monaco is pretty small. It's, It's on most maps. But in any case... (laughs) <laughs> so you know dr doom is is heard but not seen he says over the loudspeaker step forward old friend enter my humble abode it's been years since we last saw each other and namer recognizes the voice but he's not sure who it belongs to uh then we get a standard bronze age tradition if a marvel comic you know we, we've talked many times on this show the first time two superheroes meet they have to fight. That always happens. In this case, uh, super villains. Or, yeah. Um, but in this case, it's not even Doom doing the fighting. It, it's some kind of drone that he sends out. Yeah. A drone with, with big tires on it, which I like. Yeah. It's like a big which laser Namer, with tires. It, yeah. yeah. Namer, of course, makes quick work of it. And Doom says, oh, that was a truly exemplary performance. <laughs> Oh, and I love this. This is probably maybe the best line ever. And it, and, and in, in a weird way, it makes me feel like you're Doom rather than me. But uh, Doom says, uh, or Namor says, Dr. Doom, I should have known, should have suspected. And Doom says that it was all a test to determine if you are still the champion you once were. Don't fault yourself for not guessing, Namor. Few men are as subtle as Victor Von Doom. <laughs> And, and man, you know, if, if there's anything Doom is, it is subtle. Um, I just, I love both these characters so much. I love this book so much. <laughs> well, it, and again, like, it's like, let's take the two most arrogant, you know, pricks in the Marvel Universe and try to team them up. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, then, then Dr. Doom gives him a little tour. Um, you know, and again, what I love about Doom is this combination of, it's what's always appealed to me about him, the combination of the occult on the one hand and the scientific on the other hand. Yep. Um, it, you know, it's, it's the, it's the gothic castle, but the robots, you know. Right. And he tells, he tells Namor, you know, we have a common goal. Um, you know, he talks about Fantastic Four annual number one when Namor all but conquered the surface world. And he says, imagine how much more devastating and sure of success your army could be if they were guided by the wisdom and weapons of Dr. Doom. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, Doom is, uh, or Namor in this case is, uh, is unconvinced. You know, all he wants is water to restore his strength. He wants to be able to return, you know, uh, to Atlantis, but of course his gills are sewn up. Um, uh, you know, so Doom goes off to try to get him some water, uh, and Namor wonders what's going on in Atlantis. Uh, Hold on one second, Chris. Dungeon Master has something he wants to interject oh, good, here yes. at this point. Yes, sir. I never knew um, Dr. Doom was arrogant. You never knew Dr. Doom was arrogant? <laughs> no. Oh, Dr. Doom's very arrogant. The, where have you seen Dr. Doom? Just in cartoons, I guess, right? Um, cartoons, sometimes um, other things, too. Yeah, and he's not portrayed as arrogant in the cartoons? No. No? Oh, yeah, Dr. Doom's very arrogant. But Dr. Doom kind of has reason to be arrogant, because he kind of is the smartest guy in the room. True. <laughs> Unless Tony Stark or Reed Richards might be in the room. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And also, interestingly enough, 
both also incredibly arrogant. Yep. yep. So, so, you know, know Namor tells Doom, Doom I, don't, I don't care about conquering the surface world anymore. All I need is water to get me back to my full strength, and then I'll pursue my own destiny. Yep. And then we cut away to, uh, you know, we don't want to spend too much time on this because it's uh, no. Atlantis stuff. But we cut away to Triton of the Inhumans uh, bringing Namor's trident, not to be confused with the son of Satan's trident, uh, to the current ruler or the, uh, uh, to see Lady Dorma, who is the queen. Well, see, now that's interesting because you're reading this, uh, what, the Marvel Essentials? Yeah. Um, I'm reading, you know, actual giant size supervillain team up number one, and they don't reprint that part. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, they left that out. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, you know, Namor's uh, thinking about his realm and what may be happening there, um, and then it cuts right to Doctor Doom beating up uh, his butler. No, it's it's the ambassador, <laughs> the ambassador, the, uh, the Latvian ambassador to the United States is telling him that he's protesting. He shouldn't keep Namor there. Doom doesn't take kindly to that. All of his minions run uh, run in, in terror from Doctor Doom. Um, and but I love this too. He's telling them all to find water. And the line, in short, let not an ice tray remain unturned until there is no water within this entire embassy. So no, he's promised no more water, but instead he's getting rid of any water in the entire embassy. <laughs> and then he comes back. Never let it be said that Doctor Doom is petty. <laughs> <laughs> He comes back to Namor and he says, I've reconsidered my promise of aid and I have decided that I cannot spare you any water unless you agree to place the royal troops of Atlantis at my disposal. Mm -hmm. And Namor does not take kindly to that. And then we get the battle we've been waiting for. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know that we need to blow by blow, but, you know, it's it's too giant egos <laughs> it is well the thing is even when they're not fighting it's a battle of egos yeah and the whole thing is a battle of egos but then we do have the fighting and the running and the smashing and uh and then doom manages to electrocute uh the submariner and he he says he wants to the submariner to pledge the armies of atlantis to the service of doom or the submariner will die and the submariner says then die I shall. And yeah. it's just like, it's like an episode of Dark Shadows there, I think. It really is. It really is. Um, so, I, the, the one thing I do want to comment on here, during the fight, hang on, I'm looking for the panel, uh, Doom gets in an excellent burn on Namor. He says, you lunge at me like some flapping, floundering fish. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, so it, basically, Namor pretends to be unconscious. Classic move. Uh, he plays possum long enough to, uh, to end up somehow, uh, getting himself exposed to water. And why is the water there, Brian? Uh, because Doom has removed all the water from the building and a fire has begun thanks to Doom's attack on Namor. And somehow, Namor knew all of this was going to happen. Yep, just like he knew that the firemen would show up to put out the fire, and they they smash a window and spray water in from their fire hose, and that's enough to give him his strength, and swoosh, he flaps those little wings on his feet and flies away. <laughs> yeah, interlude uh, where the two characters are continuing to consider whether or not they should be teamed up together, and that leads into another flashback story. This Man, This Demon, uh, which is written by Roy Thomas with Larry That's Lieber. Right. Now, Larry Lieber, for those who are unfamiliar, is the brother of Stan Lee, whose real name was Stanley Lieber. Yep. Yep. Um, and so, and Larry Lieber is probably best known for writing the, uh, the daily Spider-Man comic book strip, you know, in cartoon strip in news. That, and I'd say the, the yeah, Atlas say comics the line, uh, was a very, uh, was a very short-lived very comics short -lived company in the seventies, but the 70s. they had some really they cool some titles. Really uh, we've talked about them on the show before. That's where 
where Devil Slayer of the, Slayer the Defenders of the actually got his start was with another company, mm-hmm. Atlas. Yep. And so Larry Lieber actually uh, co-wrote with Roy Thomas and drew this issue um, with Frank Giacoya. Giacoya, I'm saying that wrong, I know. Inks by Vince Coletta. Um, and it's just, uh, it, it starts off with one of the, one of the greats, Brian. It's Dr. Doom fighting the thing. Yep. Uh, in all their uh, Silver yeah. Age glory. Silver Age glory. And Ben Grimm, look, we haven't really had a lot of time, uh, opportunity to talk about Ben Grimm on this show. But let's just say for the record, Ben Grimm, one of the best characters Marvel That's has. Right. We've, uh, That's right. We've, uh, one of the best characters Stan Lee created. We've, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've we featured him, uh, you know, during Jack his Kirby. appearances with the Defenders and, uh, a little bit during Godzilla. Um, eventually, Chris, you know, if, if the ratings are there and the show continues, we are going to have to do. Ben Grimm's greatest ben Grimm's comic, greatest which is, of course, Marvel 2 and 1. Marvel 2 and 1. Marvel 2 and 1. Absolutely. At the very least, the Pegasus I apologize saga. to the listening audience for blowing my nose. No, it's not the coronavirus. I just have a little bit of a cold. So, <laughs> You know, Brian, until you just mentioned it, I've spent half an hour not thinking about the coronavirus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mary is actually probably anyway, going to get tested later today, so I'm. It's on my mind, I guess. Who is going to get Mary. tested? Mary. Mary. Oh, I hope she's. Well, alive. I hope she is too. She's had a. She's been sick for about a week, and she's finally doing the telemedicine today. And so we'll we'll see if they tell her to go get tested or not. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So we have the thing and Doctor Doom fighting it out. Um, and it turns out, yeah, nope, it it's just a out. trick. Nope, it's Doctor Doom it's Dr. watching an old hollow tape of him and the thing fighting it out. Yeah, and 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 then somehow, Doctor Doom's hollow tapes become solid hologram figures of the Fantastic Four, and they manage to attack Doctor Doom. And then we learn. Now, is this in yours? As yes, well? this is in mine. Yes, okay, this is in mine. all right. Uh, then we learn that this is the magic of the one called Diablo. One of my least favorite my Marvel supervillains of, of all time. Yeah, you know what? One of the reasons why he's one of my least favorite Marvel supervillains is because it seemed to me like his powers were once again one of those things where it's like he can do whatever the plot requires. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh, he, he's that, very much a MacGuffin character. MacGuffin um, character. And I always thought his costume was ridiculous, even for the Bronze Age. <laughs> well, he's Diablo, master of alchemy, creator of chemical wonders. Uh, and Diablo has shown up uh, to do the same thing that they're all doing in this, right? Right. He's, he's trying to force Dr. Doom to partner up. And Dr. Doom does Am not take to, take to that well. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I like, this is the best part, though, is Dr. Doom, Dr. Doom's fingers become some kind of strange gun weapon, and they, they fire molecules that increase in size when exposed to the air until molecules are the size of boulders. And then Diablo manages to turn the boulders into feathers. <laughs> now, if you sense a little sarcasm dripping from my voice, or not sarcasm, that's the wrong word, disdain, you would be right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not all. That's Diablo not then all. Turns, no. himself turns himself into nerveless into protoplasm, protoplasm so that Dr. Doom can't so harm him. him. Yeah. He turns himself into a big glob of nerveless p- protoplasm. Um, yeah, it's it's not good. Um, but the most important thing about the presence of Diablo is it gives Diablo the opportunity to introduce a flashback within our flashback to the youth of Victor Von Doom. That's right. Dungeon Master, do you have a um, comment on this? I think Diablo should just look like a pen because it honestly just sounds like he can just write in the, to the story whatever he wants. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Oh, I like that. I like yeah, that. So Diablo should just be a mutant pen. Yeah. And, and whatever the story needs, he can just write it in. Burn. Sort of break the fourth remind- wall like Deadpool. Yep. Okay. Dungeon Master yeah. saying that reminds me of the, the phenomenon. Since we're doing these flashbacks to our childhood, Brian, uh, 
one of my favorite Looney Tunes episodes, Looney Tunes cartoons, is the one where Daffy Duck is speaking to the audience Duck-a-buck. and speaking to the cartoonist. Yep. Yep. Uh, and is constantly frustrated by the way the cartoonist is mocking yep. him. Duck a muck. Duck a muck. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, everybody go watch that today as a, uh, you know, a healing, you know, there's nothing more healing than Looney Tunes except maybe, um, little videos of Grover from Sesame Street. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you and I aren't the only ones flashing back to our childhood. Dr. Doom. Doctor flashes back to his as well. He sees two Roma alive and joyful laughing in the afternoon sun. And and tell this is important to the plot of Supervillain Team Up. So tell us what's going on here, Chris. Well, basically, um Doctor Doom well we're learning about the uh relationship Doctor Doom had. Um we're learning about the death of his father and his promise to avenge his father's death. Um, his father died from whatever Brian currently has. <laughs> um, and, um, anyway, the father, upon his deathbed, begins to say, heed my last words. You must protect, protect. And then he dies. Yep. And young Victor says, Father, none will have to protect me. I shall become powerful, strong. I shall avenge your death. And then we get the thought balloon from one of the other Romani men who says, he did not mean to protect the boy. He meant that the world must be protected from the son who bears the name Von Doom. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, so basically, even his father knew he was a relentless psychopath who would destroy people. <laughs> so Victor goes digging so Victor through his mother's belongings, his mother's uh, belongings. all the, the uh, family heirlooms, family heirlooms. Um, and he, he finds, you know, herbs and remedies and strange objects that bear his mother's name, magic potions, forbidden scientific secrets. Uh, he discovers, in fact, that his mother was a witch. And that the occult, that the occult is, his is his true heritage. Yeah. And now we, we should point out, and all I could think about during reading this is for anyone, and I assume this is most people, anyone who's ever seen or read any version of A Christmas Carol, uh, you're familiar with um, Ebenezer Scrooge turning away from the woman he loves because his goal is more important than love and be, he becomes loveless uh in that way but victor young victor did love this young woman at this period and turns her away in the same fashion that that scrooge does but his is the pursuit not of money but of power right, right. her name was valeria that's right uh, which later is the name that susan richards gives to her daughter um as a sort of Olive Branch, in some ways, I think, to Victor. Yes, Bunder. absolutely. Uh, and Valeria, both uh, and Valeria, both Doom's mother and Valeria, uh, will have an impact on supervillain team up going forward. So it's it's important that we covered that. Doom's mother, I think, was Maria. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, in any case, uh, and and sort of thus begins the the little flashback that gives us the information about. The idea that Doom had pursued both the occult and the scientific. First, the occult, so that he would be able to, uh, you know, until he found that his powers in the occult were limited, um, uh, limited by what could be accomplished through the occult, then he joined science into the mix, um, which led to his disfiguration uh, in an experiment that he was doing at Reed Richards in college, and that's a whole other thing. Uh, and and Doom doesn't even want to see Valeria now, even though Diablo supposedly has brought her back, uh, because he knows that she can't love him because of how horribly disfigured his face is, um, or at least it, he thinks his face is. Right. And and it's right. not only that. Why would uh, you know? You know, he says nothing will ever restore him to normal. Nothing will make him feel like a man. But why would he even want to be a mere man? Uh, he's more than a man. He has ravaged the world. His very name bespeaks the dire destruction that he can rain down upon a helpless planet. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, this is very much a tortured soul. Yes, it's bombastic. It's 70s style Bronze Age writing, but 
writing. It really cuts to the the heart of Doctor Doom, which has always been really poor (laughs) self-esteem. See, folks, this is why you need therapy, so that you can so that you don't become Doctor Doom. If if Doom had only had a good therapist to work on his low self-esteem. He wouldn't have tried to destroy the world so many times or rule it so many times. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, So there you go. So then we discover that that was only a uh, a hologram of her. But Doom goes to meet with Diablo and there she is. Valeria is there in the flesh. Yep. Uh, You know, there's a battle. Fight, fight, fight. Diablo calls (laughs) Dr. Doom a buffoon. Which never goes well. Um, but, and, and this is the other thing, Brian, that at some point I want to talk about Marvel team up because Diablo, like you and I, is obsessed with Dr. Doom's time machine. Yes. Yes. And he wants to use the time machine to, you know, work with Doom to go back and forth through time and rule the world. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on, on that plan. No, we don't. He wants to go back and, and decide the fate of the Civil War so that they'll be worshipped in, uh, in gratitude. But Dr. Doom pulls um, the old switcheroo. Uh, the supervillain becomes the superhero for a moment. He actually sends Diablo far, far into Earth's future. Uh, decades of atomic holocaust and millennia of blinding, mindless destruction and decay have have left an earth decimated by eons of warfare where nothing exists except Diablo himself. Yeah, so Diablo is sent to uh December twenty twenty. Yes, basically. Yes. Um, <laughs> um yes, so Diablo gets his wish. He's gonna be the ruler of the world forevermore, but forevermore is at the end of time. Um like Elric. So Doom now has the opportunity to talk to Valeria. He says, we have a lifetime to recapture it together. And Valeria, as any rational woman would, spurns Dr. Doom's touch. Yeah. She, you know, she tells him, I, I was in love with a, a man named Victor. You're, you're a man named Doom. Um, you know, would you renounce your towering ambition for the girl you once loved? And Doom doesn't answer. And his silence is, of course. Uh, and this, this, again, is that moment in A Christmas Carol. Yep. yep. You know? Where basically she says, would you give it up? Would you like, you know, and then his silence is her answer, That's right. you know? That's right. Um, and in A Christmas Carol, she releases Scrooge from his bond. But in this case, she has her answer and she leaves Doom by himself. Great splash page. Yes. Yes. And um, then we come back to the and present to and, you know, now, now it's you know, Doom now it's demanding an answer, demanding an answer of Namor. Answer of Namor. You know, he, he says, uh, he says, you know, I, I want your answer, Atlantean. If we were allies, either you would betray me one day or else I would betray you. Being as we are, there could be no third alternative. And thus, my answer is no. And he attacks Namor. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that. I love the uh, the acknowledgement that because of our natures, one day, one of us is definitely going to betray the other. Yep. Yep. You know, it's just a matter of time. Uh and of course, that's true. Uh, Namor eventually is able to get himself exposed to water, and he's able to. Uh, well, he can't fly away, can he? No, this is yeah, this is another story. Yes, he's able to fly away, um, and Doom is left in the waves, and you know, all sad. Even the rampaging storm itself dares not defy Doom. It's raw, pulsing energy, but Namor did. <laughs> I think there is some slash fiction to be written in 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 uh, in the world of supervillain team up as well. I, I, I think maybe there is. I think maybe there is. With you know Doom yearning for Namor's raw pulsing energy. <laughs> um. So in any case, uh, Namor's thinking Doom ran away, even though he no no he even though Namor himself ran away, but Namor says only a fool fights when he's at a disadvantage. Uh, so he knows. Namor says, mark me well, Victor Von Doom. Let my words resound in your dreams and in your every waking moment. The Submariner and Dr. Doom shall fight again side by side and they shall topple the That's world. Right. And- so somehow through all of this, Namor is still insistent 
that they will eventually team up. And he's not wrong. Oh, he's not wrong. They'll team up for the next 18 issues since Super Yeah, well, plus, plus before we get to that, they'll team up next episode. In giant size, supervillain team up number two. That's right. Uh, and we'll probably also cover supervillain team up number one. In the hopefully. Next yep. Hopefully. Um, for those of you reading along at home, if you have the old Astonishing Tales series, uh, which featured Dr. Doom and Kizar, uh, you might want to pick up those giant size supervillain team up number two heavily references those issues of Astonishing Tales. Now, we're not going to be covering them next week. Uh, but it, it, there, there's a lot of flashbacks to that uh, that will that will give you a deeper understanding of the saga unfolding. Uh, but yeah, next week because there's nothing you need more than to go into deeper detail to in these stories than we're already doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Well, give the folks at home uh, the hardiest of hearty Excelsiors before we leave. Excelsior, true believers. We'll see you next week, folks. <laughs> Defenders Dialogue is a production of the Brian Keen Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wildeson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Cosmic Shenanigans, and Grindcast. To advertise on Defenders Dialogue, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts.